On the 25th of January, 2011, the streets of Cairo were being ravaged by a rioting population, demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year regime. While the world was distracted by the dramatic scenes of chaos upon the streets above, deep within the ancient dusty tunnels, a team of archaeologists led by Suzanne Bickel of the University of Basel in Switzerland was quietly making one of the most significant discoveries of the past century. They had initially found the top of a large round stone at the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings. The archaeologists suspected that it was just the top of an abandoned shaft, but before they could investigate, due to Egypt's political process regarding finds within the valley, they had to cover the stone rim with their own locked iron door, inform the Egyptian authorities, and apply for an official permit to excavate. A year later, after gaining approval to excavate, Bickel returned with a team of two dozen people, including field director Elena Paula Goth of the University of Basel, Egyptian inspector Ali Rita, and local workmen. Each took turns lying on the ground, head pressed against the shaft wall, one arm through a small hole next to the capstone, snapping photographs. They left little doubt that it was indeed an ancient tomb. On top of the debris rested a dusty black coffin, carved from sycamore wood and decorated with large yellow hieroglyphs on its sides and top. Bickel has stated that she has never seen an Egyptian coffin in such a good condition before. The dating of fragments of pottery made from Nile silt and pieces of plaster, commonly used to seal tomb entrances in ancient times, together with the age of the other nearby sites, have indicated that the tomb could be more than 3,000 years old. The hieroglyphs describe the tomb's occupant as being named Nahimi's Bastet. Egyptologists currently believe she was a lady of the upper class and of Amun. People have been claiming there was nothing new left to find in the Valley of the Kings for almost as long as they have been digging there. The Venetian antiquarian Giovanni Belzoni believed he had emptied the last of the valley's tombs during his 1817 expedition, while Theodore Davis, who excavated there a century later, came to a similar conclusion right before Tutankhamun's burial chamber was found. Fortunately, there is a growing number of people who are beginning to suspect that there is a wealth of discoveries still left to be made in the Valley of the Kings, the Nile Delta, and Egyptian as a whole. And thanks to discoveries such as these, interest in these existing mysteries grows by the day. It is interesting to see that in this period, even a wealthy girl was buried with quite simple things, Bickel says, comparing Nahim's Bastet's coffin and steel with the elaborate pottery, furniture, and food found in earlier tombs. Her wooden coffin was certainly quite expensive, she says, but nonetheless, it lacked the elaborate inner coffins found in similar burials. Is this the burial chamber of an extremely ancient queen? After reinforcing the coffin and securing the mummy, Bickel's team have transported across the Nile to Luxor, where a full investigation is currently being undertaken into the true identity of the mystery female. With substantial insight into the controversial finds within ancient Egypt, we personally suspect that often the tombs, which appear the most crudely designed, containing wooden sarcophagus, are generally found to be the most ancient. Furthermore, their hieroglyphic writings were often far more exquisite in nature. Could this be the discovery of an original burial? and the crude hieroglyphic claim of the occupant's identity a fake? Hiding the Delta's true antiquity? A secret many fringe scientists have begun to believe is being protected by Egyptian antiquities. Many have come to suspect the Egyptians merely copied the original builders of the pyramids, after taking occupation of their structures many years later. Supportive evidence for these claims comes in many forms, Erosion upon the pyramids, and especially the Sphinx, including over 100 underground chambers we are currently researching, discovered under Giza in 1995 by a team led by Kent Weeks, which also show strong evidence of several flash flooding events involving seawater throughout their long existence. 
The lack of any written detail pertaining to the construction of either monument in any hieroglyphs found in ancient Egypt, and so on. We find it incredibly intriguing that more was not made public regarding this amazing find, which leads us to suspect it may be a highly important, albeit highly controversial, discovery. We will continue to do research on Nahem's Bastet and will endeavor to keep you all informed regarding any notable findings. Kulab, a site that I have previously covered and also personally exposed the true scale of, seemingly or more than likely deliberately overlooked by academia. Kulab not only possesses an enormous ancient wall, which surrounds the entrance to the site, which according to academia, was seemingly placed upon the plateau of a naturally formed hill. However, after personally investigating this site myself, I found that not only had the wall constructed took unimaginable effort to build, but that the site beyond this impenetrable fortress had in fact been backfilled with earth, artificially creating the plateau that geologists, academics, and archaeologists alike long ignored and merely assumed was selected due to natural features, were in fact artificially created. However, it is clear for all to see that not only was the plateau painstakingly created to backfill to this fortress's wall, but the ingenious entrances were also the work of a people of tremendous intellect. Many of the passageways into the site allow many to enter the passages. However, as the invaders made their way along these elevations to penetrate the fortress itself, not only were they wide open to arrow fire from above from both sides, but also by design, the passageways slowly narrowed to a point where only one person at a time could actually enter the site. However, the purpose of this video is not the astonishing architectural features of the site itself, but possibly an exposure of the true creators of the site, a group of people with characteristics which may come as a shock to some and been long predicted by others. Found deep within a cave system within the site, a burial chamber at the depth of 800 meters, a burial chamber created at this location for the sole purpose of preserving these individuals' remains for as long as possible, and also to avoid the ravages tomb raiders that have been experienced over the eons by many of the other burial sites by many different cultures. There are many wooden idols that have seemingly been treated with lost technologies and have survived the climate astonishingly well. Yet, this set of mummies could expose once and for all who were responsible for this astonishing site and indeed its miraculous characteristics. Thankfully, although much of the ancient tombs had been ravaged by robbers over the years, this absence of mummies didn't deter archaeologist Warren Church who's worked for 19 years to save lost Pachudos and learn its secrets. Seemingly successfully unraveling its innermost protected secrets, and possibly coming face to face with its original builders, they were known as the Chachapoya or the Cloud People by the Incas, who by this stage had re-inhabited the ancient pre-Incan ruins which dot Peru, and due to the ingenious nature of the fortress, the tremendous efforts that went into building it, and the seemingly impenetrable nature of its design, the Cloud People seemingly survived all the way up until the Spanish invasion, only succumbing to the introduction of smallpox, which the Spanish seemingly brought with them. An intriguing characteristic of these enigmatic people is the fact that they left no written language, yet adorned their site with countless stone carvings of orchids, butterflies, and jaguars. According to Warren Church, for more than 500 years, the Chachapoya cut farm terraces and villages into these steep slopes. This burial chamber, found deep within the site, shows that not only did they display great respect for their dead, but that they were of European origin, white-skinned and blonde-haired, with Church apparently stating that the mummies are of the most beautiful past people he has ever witnessed. Were these mummies the remains of the original builders of this astonishing site? Or were they like the Incas, merely re-inhabitations, although how they got there to these Peruvian hills and controllers of Kulap itself remains a mystery. 
Yet, white mummies of a seemingly European ancestry have been found throughout the globe. Does this suggest that the ruling force we so often postulate once existed? That many known as the Atlanteans shared their knowledge across the globe before catastrophe? Regardless of their ethnicity, we find such research by Church highly admirable and such discoveries highly compelling. In 1835, an unknown laborer in Kent, the UK, was doing his usual field work. When he struck the soil in what could be classified as a lucky spot, upon impacting the ground, his spade disappeared into the earth, breaking a doorway into an underworld like no other. The lad soon realized that he was standing on an entrance to hollow underground caverns that from the surface could not be seen. Word quickly spread regarding the find and the curiosity to see what was actually down there soon began to boil over. A local school teacher kindly volunteers his young son Joshua to make the dangerous trip down beneath the ground to see what was actually down there. He described rooms encrusted with millions of carefully arranged shells. People were obviously a little skeptical regarding the claims initially, yet when the hole was eventually widened, allowing to see for themselves, they were stunned when the boys' accounts were confirmed as completely true. Now known as the Shell Grotto of Margate, its origins or purpose still remains a complete mystery to this day. Almost all the surface area of the walls and roof are covered in mosaics created entirely out of seashells, totaling about 190 square meters of mosaic calculated to be around 4.6 million shells. Various hypotheses have dated its construction to any time in the past 3,000 years. Theories have included that it was an 18th or 19th century rich man's folly, that it was a prehistoric astronomical calendar, and even that it could be connected to the Knights Templar. Interestingly, no publicly known scientific dating of the site has yet to be completed. The most frequently used shells throughout the mosaic, mussels, Cockles, whelks, limpets, scallops, and oysters are largely local. They could have been found in sufficient numbers from four possible bays, yet the majority of the mosaic is formed from the flatwinkle, which is used to create the background infill between the designs. However, this shell is found only rarely locally, so would have been collected from shores west of Southampton. Shell Grotto is certainly an amazing, yet not very well-known find. More scientific research is clearly needed if we are to unravel the mysteries of its incredible construction. Within a place called Laos, a landlocked country in the heart of the Indo-Chinese peninsula, is probably one of the most confusing archaeological sites on Earth. We have often covered possible evidence left within countless newspaper archives, log witness testimonies, and indeed many stolen bodies of a type of ancient human far larger than we are today. Additionally, there have been many intriguing ancient giant artifacts which have been found at many sites around the world, tools, utensils, and structures, created in such scales they would be virtually useless in the hands of modern-sized people. And our archaeological site within Laos could perhaps be seen as one of the more compelling remnants possibly left by this gigantic race of humans. However, what is seemingly the most perplexing mystery regarding this site is the aptly named Frogman, discovered at the center of this entire historical puzzle. Known as the Plain of Jars, it is an enormous ancient site, littered with countless giant stone jars, manufactured to such a scale they are clearly too large for any practical use by humans of today. Numbering over 400 at just one site, the original purpose for these stone jars high up in these locations, if indeed they were manufactured by our ancient ancestors, is a question which has evaded modern explanation and may remain impossible to answer. Out of the many hundreds of jars, it would seem none were ever decorated. All remained completely blank, except one single jar. A single giant jar adorned with the image of a frogman. According to academia, the jars date from the Iron Age around 500 BC, although any compelling reasoning for this remains elusive. It is undoubtedly 
one of the most important prehistoric sites in Southeast Asia, and it undoubtedly deserves more attention. Who carved these enormous jars? Why make them to such enormous and thus impractical sizes? Where did the stone come from? Or indeed, how were they carried to their final resting places high up on these plateaus? Were they possibly made by a race of giants? Who is our Frogman character? Was this single image a signature, left by the original makers of these giant jars? Unfortunately, we may never know. Found in Siberia, and dating back to a time said by modern science to have been that of the Denisovan species of early humans, scientists have confirmed this bracelet is 40,000 years old, making it the oldest piece of jewelry ever discovered. The bracelet was discovered at a site now known as Denisova Cave, in the Altai region of Siberia in 2008. After detailed analysis, Russian experts now accept that the bracelet's age is authentic. Scientists explained it away, sorry, concluded, that it must have been made by our prehistoric human ancestors, the Denisovans, an extinct species of humans, and just showed them to have been far more advanced than ever realized. However, further analysis has left them in a bit of difficulty, with their conclusions as to who the makers could have been, a hole initially thought to have been caused by erosion, is actually a purposely placed drill hole, created by the maker of the bracelet, by using what can only be assumed, was a fine jeweler's drill. Writing in the Novosibirsk magazine, Science First Hand, Dr. Derevyanko said, two fragments of the bracelet were found, with a width of 2.7 cm and a thickness of 0.9 cm. Near one of the cracks is a drilled hole with a diameter of about 0.8 cm. Studying the drill hole, reluctant scientists found that the speed of rotation of the drill's bit would have been rather high, fluctuations minimal, and that it was applied with an advanced implement, technology that is common for more recent times, Dr. Derevyanko told the Siberian Times. Predictably, since this feature was discovered, the scientific community's forthcoming explanations have fallen silent. Who made this bracelet? It seems it is left to all those who do not have to protect a career within a paradigm, to postulate and ponder. <laughs>